31. When local news breaks, the wave is there. Soft Gold, WHAV. Catch the wave! Those political sound bites you hear on the news are, at best, incomplete and could be misleading or even outright lies. This is David Pakman. Take time to delve into the truth by listening to The David Pakman Show, Tuesday through Friday nights at 8 on WHAV. Lack of logic and reason are exposed on The David Pakman Show as newsmakers collapse under cross-examination. Remember, only local radio can bring you this talk opportunity, but only WHAV does. Wave weather! I'm WHAV meteorologist Gary Best with Wave Weather. A chance of snow showers developing across the Merrimack Valley during the night. Temperatures steady or rising through the night. And then we're looking at a light mix early Tuesday morning becoming rain though, then rain heavy at times. During the afternoon, the winds pick up. High temperature in mid to upper 30s. Rain showers at night in the 30s and a chance of showers on Wednesday. Temperatures up near 40. I'm Gary Best. Your next Wave Weather coming up in 30 minutes. From the Edwin B. Johnson Newsroom, WHAV presents the Open Mic Show with Tim Coco. Make your voice heard. Call 978-374-1900. That's 978-374-1900. Or email tcoco at whav.net. And welcome to another edition of the Open Mic Show, a 50-year staple of democracy in the Merrimack Valley. This hour of the Open Mic Show is being brought to you by Haverhill Bank, just one bank. We do have banking news, not Haverhill Bank, uh, but TD Bank, and it's not good news. We'll talk about that in just a moment. First, let's talk about where and how to listen to the program. Of course, for the next two hours, you can watch and listen to the program at whav.tv on your computer or smartphone. You can also watch it on Haverhill Community Television, 8C Media, Channel 22, uh, Comcast in Haverhill. Of course, you can listen to WHAV 24 hours a day, seven days a week at whav.net, again, on your computer or smartphone, on AM radio, 1640, and cable television, usually the audio behind those community bulletin boards uh, in Andover, Channel 8, Haverhill, Channel 22, Methuen channels 8 and 22 on Comcast, Channel 32 on Verizon Fios, Plasto channels 17 and 23, and Sandown channel 17. Uh, Incidentally, I understand uh, we've said this before, but maybe someone can confirm that it's still true. Uh, Channel 32 out of Methuen on Verizon Fios is uh, visible or audible, as the case may be, statewide. So if you know someone in a community that has uh, Verizon Fios, uh, chances are they may also be able to listen to the program. Again, uh, on those channels, it's simply the audio behind the bulletin board. Love to hear from you tonight. Uh, Open lines tonight. I have a few topics that we can seed the conversation with, and I think some that will uh, interest many longtime listeners. Uh, But let me tell you how you can participate. You can, and we want you to do this if you want to win a prize, you can call me, 978-374-1900. It's always on the TV screen if you're watching. If you're listening, I'll repeat it again, 978-374-1900. If you're shy and you want to pass along a news tip, not just during this program, but anytime, you can write to me directly by email at tcoco, T-C-O-C-O, at W-H-A-V dot net. You can also participate during the program 
by posting a comment. Uh, go to whav.tv, and below the TV screen that's there, you'll be able to write in a comment. You can sign in with Facebook, Twitter, all kinds of accounts, so there's no reason to create a new account, but you are welcome to. If you become a WHAV member, and hopefully you are a member or are contemplating it, uh, you can get a WHAV login as well. Uh, breaking news, just as we went on the air with this program, and uh, it's also just been posted uh, to the website, whav.net, uh, uh, but TD Bank in Haverhill had a data breach, and uh, it has been uh, working with the Attorney General's office on a settlement, and it looks like TD Bank is going to pay $625,000 to strengthen its security practices. Uh, And if I have the the gist of this right, uh, TD Bank in Haverhill, I don't know which branch, I'm not sure the Attorney General said, uh, but TD Bank in Haverhill uh, needed to move some of its data on uh, encrypted uh, tapes and uh, gave them to a courier who somehow lost them. And so up to 90,000 Massachusetts customers uh, may have had their security breached. And again, this was coming out of a Haverhill branch of TD Bank. I don't know if all the branches have this much data or whether it came out of the uh, the principal uh, TD Bank branch, formerly Family Bank, formerly Haverhill Savings Bank, and I think about 10 other names while it was uh, uh, under uh, North Bank and some of these other names. Uh, but what uh, the reason they're paying the settlement, the 625000 is because they failed to tell the attorney general. In other words, they failed to tell you that your data had been lost and could potentially be in the wrong hands. Uh, here's a quote from uh, the attorney general and most recently gubernatorial candidate. Uh, Massachusetts data breach law requires businesses to provide notice of a data breach promptly. Businesses are required to secure the sensitive information that consumers entrust to them and cannot subject consumers to unnecessary risk by failing to provide prompt notice when that information is compromised or lost. Uh, Let's see specifically, uh, it's a rather lengthy story. Uh, This goes back to uh, March 2012. Let's, uh, if you'll bear with me, this is breaking news on WHAV. Uh, The bank was was moving this data, physically moving it, um, by a a third-party courier from its Haverhill office to its Springfield office. And that was in March 2012. Uh, two unencrypted, okay, it's not encrypted. This was plain invisible data. Two unencrypted computer server backup tapes were to be transported by a third party courier from its Haverhill office to its Springfield office. When the tapes didn't arrive, Again, this is from the Attorney General. TD Bank undertook an internal investigation to determine the contents of the tapes and determined that the tapes may have included the names, address, social security numbers, account numbers, or other data elements such as date of birth or driver's license numbers of Massachusetts residents. Uh, Despite this, the bank did not notify the attorney general general, and potentially affected consumers about the breach as required by state law until October. Uh, So this happened in March. They got around to telling the state, you know what, we lost a lot of data, uh, and they told this in October. 
Now, more than two, we, we heard about 90,000 individual pieces, but uh, we'll see if we can reconcile this. More than 260,000 consumers nationwide were impacted by the uh, incident, uh, including 90,000 Massachusetts residents. Okay, so 90,000 in Massachusetts, more outside of Massachusetts. You know, I always wonder if these uh, bank consolidations are a good thing. And, uh, you know, we actually make this joke in our own office, and I'm not sure I should say it on air, but uh, our uh, computer servers are uh, encrypted with a military-grade security. Uh, Those of you who know more about this than I do, it's something like 448-bit encryption. And so, uh, theoretically anyway, uh, it's bulletproof. Uh, That is, unless you break into the office, please don't break into the office, and take the server. Well, so all this security, the bank hands off uh, the data for 90,000 Massachusetts residents, just hands it off to a courier. It's lost. They don't tell anyone about it. And so uh, I wonder how many of you might have been victims of, of the breach. And, you know, this information, if Social Security number and birthday, I mean, generally those two items will unlock the world for someone. So let me know what you think about these data breaches. Our tech-heavy days, uh, this day and age, um, it doesn't matter about the safe now, does it? Uh, They can just take this stuff off a data tape. 978-374. 1900. 978 374 1900. Okay, we're still taking uh, birthday wishes. Um, I talked to uh, last uh, week's winner. So was it last week? Uh, and uh, she is getting her letter uh, allowing her to pick up her cake at LBD's second generation Italian bakery in Bradford. That's at 140 South Main Street. Again, what strikes me about these people, not only that they make the wonderful, delicious uh, baked goods and cakes and, and pizzas and all this stuff, they do it from six in the morning on. I mean, that's the middle of the night for some of us, six in the morning. But anyway, we're taking your birthday and anniversary wishes for January uh, for the next couple of weeks. So call in and wish someone a happy birthday or a couple a happy anniversary, and their name will be placed into the hat for drawing the last Monday of the month that uh, the open mic show was on the air. All right, so that's a free 7-inch cake, choice of chocolate or vanilla. Now, another prize. You could win a $10 gift certificate to Kimball Tavern Antiques. Oh, let me digress a moment. I spoke to former open mic show host Jack Bevilacqua today. Um, In case his mother is listening, I'll uh, leave some of the details out. But Jack did his holiday shopping for his mother at Kimball Tavern Antiques. Again, we'll leave out the details of what he purchased. Uh, We don't want to give away the prize unless he's already given it to her. Uh, But uh, some wonderful, you know, antiques make wonderful gifts. It helps complete someone's collection. Maybe it's a... It replaces a a piece of china from a set, uh, or perhaps it augments a a collection that they keep. So uh, holiday shopping in Haverhill is possible. So look at that. But anyway, our friends at Kimball Tavern Antiques are providing a $10 gift certificate to the first person who can answer this three-part question. Now, this is, uh, this is difficult, but people ultimately do win these prizes. Uh, with the, the great bowling alley fiasco of last year, we were able, uh, it took months, but we got the, the winner. Uh, but here, here's the question. Uh, before the Santa parade started in Haverhill 50 years ago, and that's a, that's a clue right there, uh, there was another annual activity. It was a Christmas party that took place where? And then when it became so big, it had to move where? And at those events, who played Santa Claus? Okay, got that, folks? Three-part question. Fifty years ago, there was a big Christmas party that took place every year in Haverhill. It started at one location. Which one was it? It got so big it had to move to a bigger location. Which one was it? And at those events, 
Someone well-known in Haverhill played Santa Claus. There's a clue there. Can you name that person? First person to answer receives a $10 gift certificate to Kimball Tavern Antiques, corner of Salem and South Main Streets in Haverhill. Okay, uh, I don't know if you've uh, been to WHAV.net lately, uh, but it has become the go-to source for Haverhill News. Now, there's some regional news for the communities that WHAV reaches by cable television, so you'll you'll find some Methuen items in Sandown and Plasto and Andover. But really, uh, its biggest push is Haverhill. Haverhill was called a news desert uh, a few years ago by Tom Stites, the founder of the Banyan Project. And uh, WHAV has stepped up. I think you could hardly call it a news desert now. Uh, but go to WHAV.net. Go to the bottom of the page, and you can sign up for headlines every day or and or you can sign up for the monthly Wavelengths newsletter. Now, the Wavelengths newsletter just went out to uh, members and subscribers uh, last night. And there's a, uh, an article, the third part of a series about WHAV itself, the Rocky Road to FM. Now, why are we doing this series? We're doing it because there is, we hope, about to be a new WHAV-FM. It'll be the third station in Haverhill to use that name. And uh, I'll tell you more about that when we return from the break. We're going to have a, um, a moment in Massachusetts history today, in fact. Uh, it'll tell you what happened on this day. We'll be back after that. Open mic! Tim Coco and the Open Mic will be right back. Get in on the action. Call 978-374-1900 or email tcoco at whav.net. If you are enjoying this program, please consider making a donation right now. Your donations to not-for-profit WHAV help keep these vital community services on the air. Donate online at www.whav.net. Stay informed each day with local news, coupled with Pacifica's worldwide coverage. Only local radio can bring you local news, but only WHAV does. Catch the wave! Hi, I'm meteorologist Gary Best. Do you need to know if it's going to be hot or cold, wet or dry? Well, find out every half hour, seven days a week with wave weather. I'll keep you in touch with up-to-the-minute reports covering the greater Merrimack Valley and beyond. It's WHAV for accurate weather when you want it. Today is December 8th. On this day in 1912, over 1,000 people gathered at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York to hear Boston writer Mary Anton. She had come to make a plea for more aid to support Jewish immigrant girls arriving alone in the United States. Anton had recently published The Promised Land, a childhood memoir of her emigration from Russia to Boston's South End. She believed that the strength of her story lay in the fact that it illustrated scores of unwritten lives. Attention from the book brought Mary Anton into social and professional circles that included Theodore Roosevelt and other prominent Americans. She became a vocal and energetic presence in public conversations about the most critical issues of the early 20th century, including immigration, education, and Zionism. For more about this and other Mass Moments, go online to massmoments.org. Brought to you by the Massachusetts Foundation for the Humanities. From the Edwin B. Johnson Newsroom, WHAV presents the Open Mic Show with Tim Coco. Make your voice heard. Call 978-374-1900. That's 978-374-1900. Or email tcoco at whav.net. Welcome back to the Open Mic Show. This hour of the Open Mic Show is being brought to you by Haverhill Bank. Just one bank. 
Haver Bank's been doing quite a bit with uh, all of the local holiday traditions, and you'll be hearing more about that on WHAV, so stay tuned for that information. Uh, I was kind of hinting at something earlier. Yes, uh, the third part of a history of FM in Haverhill went out yesterday. It's on uh, WHAV.net. It's part of the Haverhill Heritage Series. And this time we uh, took the period from 1959 uh, through 1980. And it's about the second incarnation of WHAV-FM. You may recall in the first segment, the um, FM station failed because of a lot of reasons. The FCC moving the band so that everyone who had a radio could no longer receive stations. Uh, That hurt. 1959, the second owners of WHAV brought back a uh, FM station. Uh, And our story, not to give away too much, kind of concludes that was it really successful after all because uh, the call letters are gone and that station, that FM, is no longer licensed to Haverhill, no longer officially part of Haverhill. So the the new, the third WHAV uh, is uh, under consideration by the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, to give away a little bit, we filed amendments today with the Federal Communications Commission, and so did our competitor, the um, St. Patrick's Catholic Church Educational Radio Association. And uh, the idea is to reach some agreement on our differences and perhaps allow two new stations in this area, one for Haverhill, one for Lawrence. Uh, That's all we really have right now, but I understand we have a birthday wish on the phone. You are on the open mic show. You've been so busy lately, it's hard to get in to talk to you. Oh, well, I'm glad you called. You know, we do think about you often. We try to keep track of our regular listeners because they're so valuable to us. And you're all kind of part of the cast, as though this were like a sitcom. Uh, But we all know the little personal stories. Uh, You had a slip and fall some time ago. How are you dealing with that? Okay, now I had another fall. (laughs) You had another one. See, this is how we this is we need to get like organ music and do the soap opera. When we last left Marcel, she was on the floor of the supermarket. Uh but she's recovered from that. But what happened this time, Marcel? This was in the house. <laughs> oh. I won't go into it. But uh, I was really lucky I didn't break anything, that's all I know. <laughs> oh good. Well i I'm glad to hear that. Good luck. Now I've been listening faithfully though. Oh well thank you. Uh any any comments? Well, you know, my person, who was 100 years old, actually 101, won the birthday cake uh, the month before. Oh, right. And then they had a picture in the paper because she has, her birthday was on voting day, and she never missed a chance to vote. Oh, okay, good, see? Now I got another birthday here. All right, well, great, let's hear it. This is for uh, Samuel Yanku. Samuel. He's going to be 90. Samuel will be 90 on what day? January 10th. January 10th. See, Marcel knows how to do this. We're doing birthdays for January. So Samuel is going to be 90 years old. Happy birthday, Samuel. Uh, what? Where does Samuel live? Not exactly. What city? Oh, Haverhill. He lives in Haverhill. Maybe uh, a veteran. He's a veteran? Okay. Maybe he's listening? No? <laughs> And, uh, you know, that the three-part question. Okay. You know, everyone th- thinks that when it gets this tough, you're going to be the one who wins. So we have people betting on you. It's a big racket now. No. Well, I, I'm not there yet. I get the last two parts. It's the first part. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm going to guess on the first part. Just. Uh, oh, you're ready, to, you're ready to try it? Well, if I don't get the first part, I won't tell you the other two. The, the other two, I think I'm right. It's the where it began that's the problem. Okay. So There's... the only thought I have on where the thing began was um, there was a Fleet Street uh, dog. Um... Oh, the dog pound? Yeah. Well, that's not the answer I have here. So you want to save those other two so you don't I give will, it away? I w- that's the one I'm, not, I'm having trouble with the very first part. All right. Now, but I'm curious now about your story. D- did the dog pound have uh, Christmas parties? Well, that's what somebody told me. 
Oh. But, well, uh, that could be interesting trivia for a future Haverhill Heritage story. Uh, I hope David Goudswood is listening. <laughs> oh, I remember about Fleet Street was the cute little animal, the uh, the little dogs there. They had a um, pet shop. Oh, this was the, uh, okay, not the dog pound then. It was the um, Harmon's Pet Shop. Oh, you even know the name. Wow. Well, because, you know, he moved, um, he actually was one of the businesses that moved, stayed in Haverhill after Urban Renewal, and he went downtown. Uh, it's that kind of, uh, the rent center is there now. And uh, my understanding uh, from uh, late mayor and attorney Jim Waldron is um, when they, he put up his new building on Merrimack Street near Haverhill Bank, uh, the city also and housing authority was laying out the alignment for Merrimack Street. Now, it didn't change by much, maybe a few inches here and there as it went up and down. But as they were changing the alignment of Merrimack Street, apparently the, the map got out of whack and uh, the pet shop property uh, could not get a clean title. So I understand that for years he had to rent the land rather than own it uh, because Urban Renewal... Uh, messed up the title. So that's all I know about Harmon. <laughs> was there a police station on Fleet Street? It was part of the, it was in the back of the city hall, but other people who, are, you know, I barely remember this, so other people can tell me more, but I understand. Actually, I'd love to hear more about the dog pound. I mean, all of this was happening right in our downtown. Um, so I would, I guess the, uh, the new police, police station isn't that far uh, from the old one in the back of City Hall. So maybe some trivia questions there. Are you listening, uh, uh, Mr. Wood? <laughs> maybe something <laughs> the there. The other thing, I just got a copy of the, um, you know, Haverhill Library puts out, the friends put out a calendar with old pictures of Haverhill. I heard some good things about this year. I haven't gotten mine yet. How is it? Uh, I kind of like two things on it, seeing it's um, one of them... It, they call it Central Square, which is a new name to me for Bradford Square. Actually, I've always known it as Central Square. Oh, you have. But, you know, most people don't. The only reason I do is because newspaper reporters have to be very accurate. And I bet no one else in the world knew that except Barney Gallagher and myself. <laughs> really, I had never heard it. You know, we always had. They got it from the Bradford looking towards the Haverhill. Okay. I finally figured that out, and you can see the uh, the tower of the Armenian church up the hill here. But they've got the the real the tracks there, the steel tr rails, you know. Hey, that's a good gift idea too. Uh, how much are those calendars? Well, this I got free. Oh, all right. But uh, if you get them down the library, they're ten sixty. Ten dollars sixty cents. Yeah, something like that, with the tax With it. the tax. So go down to the Friends Shop right inside the Haverhill Public Library, right near the entrance, and that's a good holiday gift item as well. Well, not everybody likes uh, history, so I'm finding that I, you know, I ask people before I give it to them. I don't want to give them the calendar if they don't like it. Oh, sure, I understand. Yeah. Now, the another picture they have is of downtown. Now, this I kind of like. It's, um, you wouldn't believe all the cars. This, I think this is post-World War II, so it must be the mid-late 40s. Yeah, actually, is this the one that's uh, of of White's Corner? Um, I, I, no. Oh, okay, because someone told me. I don't know if it's on this group. It may uh, be in here, but this one I'm looking at isn't. Okay. Uh, White's Corner. Is that Winter Street? White's Corner is um, Merrimack, Water, and Main Streets, and Bridge Street, I guess. Oh, that's what they call White's Corner over there. Where they used to have Carbonis, you mean? Right, no. right. No. I this mean, is, so. Um, well, it's the Grant Building, is what it says. Ah. But I had, hadn't heard this name for since I was a, a taught. Skiva Spears. What's that? Oh, the uh, the store. It's, it was in Haverhill. Oh, okay. That's right. There were actually, all of the big brand name stores were there. Uh, there was Sears. There was Grant's. Um, I'm not. I, I don't know that Park Snows was a major brand, but it was there. And it just said Skiva Spears, right? Yeah, and that's what the picture is of that. And 
And it's just a, a, a name I hadn't heard mentioned in a lifetime. Yeah, what kind of things did they sell? Was it a department store? I believe so, yeah. Okay. And then, uh, of course, I remember going down in Grants, and they had the stairs. You used to go down in the basement. Yeah, actually, there were all kinds of great stores. Now, Grants, is that the, is that the building that had the bowling alley in it? I don't think so. All right. One of those buildings had a bowling alley. Now, I should know this by now, after we went through the great bowling alley fiasco uh, <laughs> this year, <laughs> but which building had the bowling alley, but one of those did. And I understand that some of those, um, some of those bowling alley parts ended up being reused at Academy Lanes in Bradford. But anyway, that's a, another story for another day. Now, Park well, Snow, if, it, if I'm correct, they lived up in my section up here. I think, I can't think of the avenue. It goes up through uh, Lawrence Street, and they had the corner big mansion. Oh, really? Now, so it was a successful had, store, I take it. Yeah, they had a uh, tennis court, courts in the ba down in the back. Oh. They would let anybody use them, and that's where I learned to play tennis Anyone could go down there. In their, at their home? Yeah. Wow. Very nice. Very nice. Because now it's, they're all condos and the tennis court's gone. Yeah, it figures, doesn't it? Yeah. But oh, I well. just thought that brought back some memories. Oh, maybe some people can, uh, you know, thumb through the calendar for us and give us their memories, too. That's not a bad idea. Well, yeah, it does. All right. Actually. So, well, happy birthday, Samuel. Right. Uh, and if I don't get to talk to you, happy holidays to everyone there and you. Uh, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I, um, is, it, uh, is it this weekend uh, uh, people are doing the potato pancakes? Uh, uh, the 16th. The 16th. The 16th. Okay. Yeah. I've been invited. Um, I don't know that I've ever had potato pancakes. What are they called? Latkes? Yeah, but uh, my father used to send me down to Demoulis to buy this big bag. They were all prepared, potato pancakes. Oh, that sounds like it's cheating. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I don't. <laughs> all right, so Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah. Right. All right, take, thank you so much for your call. Okay, bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Okay, we're going to go to... Um, Local news. The local news doesn't yet have this TD Bank story. We'll talk about that on this program. Uh, Dana Esmol, news director, will also talk about uh, the autopsies that are going to be following soon for this Bradford husband and wife uh, that passed away over the weekend uh, under uh, unusual circumstances. Uh, we'll also have some more news and then national news and local weather. And we'll be back with more of the Open Mic Show and your calls at that time. Open mic! Tim Coco and the Open Mic will be right back. Get in on the action. Call 978 374 1900 or email tcoco at whav.net. If you are enjoying this program, please consider making a donation right now. Your donations to not for profit WHAV help keep these vital community services on the air. Donate online at www.whav.net. It's 7.04. WHAV Merrimack Valley. WHAV is a not-for-profit service of Public Media of New England Incorporated. It's heard on 1640 AM, the web, at whav.net and participating cable television stations. Here's what's happening in local news. The Haverhill City Council is being asked to accept a street within a housing development as a public way. On the council agenda, a petition from Russell F. Ahern, manager for developer RFA Co. LLC, is asking the city to accept Riverdale Avenue extension as a public way. The petition is returning to the council following a favorable recommendation from the Haverhill Planning Board. That panel's approval came as a result of a hearing held last month to release an escrow for work completed at the Phillips Crossing subdivision. According to minutes of the board meeting, City Engineer John Pettis III had communicated that, quote, if any small item were missed that he would make sure that it would get addressed before the council meeting, end quote. 
Prior to the planning board meeting, a Riverdale Avenue resident raised concerns in a letter to city officials over alleged unresolved construction issues, including an incorrect sprinkler system installation and ground settling issues, which led to ruts in a driveway and tilting front steps at her home. The Haverhill City Council meets at 7 p.m. Tuesday in council chambers at Haverhill City Hall. Autopsies are due to be performed as part of an ongoing state police investigation into the, quote, unattended deaths of a Haverhill couple found unresponsive in a Lamal Avenue home Saturday morning by their young children. Carrie Kimball Monahan, spokesperson for Essex District Attorney Jonathan Blodgett, told WHAV the identities of a 36-year-old woman and a 39-year-old man are being withheld as the deaths occurred inside their home and at this time there is no criminal issue involved. Foul play is not suspected at this time, and um, the cause and manner of death would be determined by the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner in Boston, uh, who will perform an autopsy and toxicology screens as a standard procedure to determine the cause and manner of death. And Kimball Monahan said the Department of Children and Families have placed the children, ages 10 and 8, in the custody of a grandmother whom the children contacted first. As is standard practice, the Department of Children and Families is notified when you know children are involved in a situation like this. And uh, fortunately, the grandmother uh, was able to come to the home and meet with the the social workers from DCF, and she now has custody of the children. Again, an investigation by state police assigned to District Attorney Blodgett's office is ongoing. According to Kimball Monahan, it could take, quote, quite some time before final autopsy results are completed. In local high school sports, no scheduled matches on Monday for the Haverhill Hillies. Remember, WHAV is the only Haverhill-based news source, and it's always free. In the Edwin V. Johnson Newsroom, this is Dana Esmail. From Feature Story News in Washington, I'm Rebecca Foster. The U.S. Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel says the U.S. will not be reviewing its operations to free American hostages despite the failure of recent missions. American journalist Luke Summers and South African teacher Pierre Corky were killed by al-Qaeda in Yemen during a U.S.-led operation on Saturday. Kate Fisher reports from Washington. Saturday's botched mission was the third failed rescue attempt of a U.S. hostage in the past six months. Chuck Hagel has defended it, saying such raids were risky but that there was no need for a policy review because the process is about as thorough as it can be. This is uh, further evidence of uh, America's continued commitment uh, to always find its uh, American hostages no matter where they are and make every effort to get those hostages returned. Last month, the White House said President Obama had ordered a review of U.S. policy on freeing American hostages, but said he still opposed the payment of ransoms. A long-awaited congressional report criticizing the CIA's use of harsh interrogation methods is due out imminently. Concerns are already being raised. It could lead to a backlash by Islamic militant groups. Here's FSN's Verity Gear. The report, which is a summary of a 6,000-page study, is expected to be released this week. It's the first public account of the CIA's alleged use of torture on suspected al-Qaeda detainees held in secret facilities in Europe and Asia in the years following the 9-11 attacks. Republicans have warned the release of this report could trigger violence and deadly retaliation. The report's expected to detail the agency's use of waterboarding, sleep deprivation and humiliation, among other techniques. While the Secretary of State, John Kerry has urged the senator in charge of the report to reconsider the timing of the release. The Obama administration say they support it. Meanwhile, U.S. diplomatic and military posts overseas are being put on alert over a potential backlash. On his first visit to Washington, Britain's Prince William is urging world leaders to join the battle against the illegal trade in wildlife. He said organized criminal gangs now dominate the trade and he said it poses a threat to global security. Simon Marks reports. Prince William spoke at the World Bank shortly after a White House meeting with President Obama. He says he's creating a task force to stop the transport industry from being unwittingly sucked in to the illegal trade in wildlife. Private sector actors are often ignorant of the role they play in the trade chain. If we are to crack down on wildlife crime, 
this trade must be stifled. He said organised gangs make $20 billion a year from the wildlife trade, and he said he's not willing to let his children grow up in a world where iconic species are under threat. From bureaus worldwide, this is FSN. Wave weather! I'm WHAV meteorologist Gary Best with Wave Weather. A chance of snow showers developing across the Merrimack Valley during the night. Temperatures steady or rising through the night. And then we're looking at a light mix early Tuesday morning becoming rain though, then rain heavy at times. During the afternoon, the winds pick up. High temperature in mid to upper 30s. Rain showers at night in the 30s and a chance of showers on Wednesday. Temperatures up near 40. I'm Gary Best. Your next Wave Weather coming up in 30 minutes. WHAV is on Facebook. For quick access, visit whav.net and click on the Facebook icon. WHAV, Merrimack Valley, open mic! From the Edwin B. Johnson Newsroom, WHAV presents the Open Mic Show with Tim Coco. Make your voice heard. Call 978-374-1900. That's 978-374-1900. Or email tcoco at whav.net. Welcome back to the Open Mic Show. This hour of the Open Mic Show still being brought to you by Haverhill Bank. Just one bank. Okay, let's look and see what's on the uh, comment boards. Let's see what this one is. Um, David God's word. Uh, I could count on David. A well-made latke is a thing of beauty. A poorly made latke is hash browns. Either is tasty with applesauce. Okay, for those of you celebrating Hanukkah, and we should all celebrate everybody's holidays. Uh, Although, in the scope of things, Hanukkah is not a giant event like uh, Christmas is. Uh, There are bigger events in the Jewish calendar. Uh, The coincidence of timing makes us celebrate them this way. I'm sure uh, Marcel will attest and others. Uh, But David Goudswood makes a good point. A well-made latke, and I hope I'm saying that right, is a thing of beauty. A poorly made one is simply hash browns. Either way, tasty with applesauce. Speaking of the holidays, uh, our own volunteer extraordinaire, Nathan E. Webster III, is in master control, and he's going to tell us what he did at Chillfest, formerly known as Downtown Stroll. Nate, are you there? I am here, Tim. All right, so the, there's our there's Nate. What did you do? You were working there? You were helping out? I was actually volunteering with Penteca Bank with the Pictures with Santa. Pictures with Santa. Did you have your picture taken with Santa? I did not. Well, see, Nate's just an overgrown kid. I'm surprised. Yeah. Maybe Santa wouldn't let him on his knee. No, I, I don't think I'd fit on Santa's knee. All right, so uh, Pentucket Bank had a photos with Santa. What time did that start? Uh, that was uh, 2 o'clock and went to 5 o'clock. 2 to 5 on Saturday. Mm-hmm. All right, did you have a chance to v- uh, voyage out to see any more of um, Chill Fest? I didn't. I worked there the whole time. So Worked there the whole time. Yep. Okay, maybe others have um, observations. Is Was Chill Fest simply a renamed Christmas stroll? Or was there something uh, that made it um, a little different for you this year? Uh, The Christmas Stroll Chill Fest downtown, sponsored by the Greater Haverhill Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Most of the businesses had uh, some kind of an event going on. Tell us what your experiences were. Well, Nate, uh, from the people coming in to have their photos taken, what was your job? Uh, Gift bags. You were handing out gift bags. Right. Each gift bag had a coloring book and crayons. Um, a book with uh, qu- the little spaces for quarters, and then uh, a toy. Oh, you mean like those uh, collectors' candy. quarters? Um, yeah, kind of like to teach kids how to uh, save up their money and stuff, and how to put the quarters in little slots and things. And okay, stuff. kids, here's here's uh, here's my advice on that. Put all the quarters in the book, 
<laughs> and then bring them to WHAV. We need your contributions. Yeah, exactly. We have a jar <laughs> waiting at the front desk. <laughs> okay. Um, so my job was gift bags, and then I helped with, with balloons a little bit, too. Balloons? Now, did you have to blow them up? Uh, no, someone else blew them up, and I just ran back and forth and grabbed stacks at a time and handed them out to the kids with my daughter. All right, how come I, I didn't get a coloring book? Um, <laughs> I didn't know you want one, Tim. <laughs> Well, you know, during the long breaks uh, during the show, but that's okay. And we have a lot had a lot of chocolate Santas to give out, and uh, chocolate those are, Santas. Those are very popular, very popular. Yeah, those of us who are now having to watch their sugar intake, um, I probably would have risked it for a chocolate Santa. But that's you know that's life. Yeah. So they had uh, they had some candy and toys in the gift bags as well as a little book and gave out balloons. Pictures with Santa went very well. Uh, we did not have the crowds that we usually have. I'll tell you that much, and oh, okay. I think it's so, because of the rain. Oh, okay. You think the rain kept people away, not the name change? I think the rain and the fact that they moved the pictures from where the bank used to be, where they used to be at the bank in the community room, oh, okay, down to the other end of Washington Street where it was like next to the tap, and it was like... You know, I don't think half the people knew it was there. I honestly don't. And plus the rain, I think, drove drove away a lot of people, too. Okay, so Merrimack Street really wasn't a participant. Everything moved to Washington. Everything was went down on Washington Street. And I think that was geared towards, like, you know, combining it into that section of Washington Trying Street. Trying to condense it a bit. Well, were there other Merrimack Street businesses that uh, went to Washington Street to... To do things? I wish I had gone, but I was uh, tied up with something. I don't know if there were other Merrimack Street businesses. I think we were one of the ones that went down there. I'm not sure if there were others, but I think the businesses that already exist on Washington were there. Plus, we moved uh, into one of the spaces in there, too. So, Okay. Now, uh, I know that before the License Commission last week, um, we had Sharon Cohen from the TAP there uh, scheduling, I believe it was a, a rehearsal. No, I... I well, there's probably two different things, a Christmas event and a rehearsal dinner. And I thought, oh, well, 90 Washington Street, isn't that normally used for the shops? Uh, different charitable groups used to get together each year and, and sell their wares at the shop to support their charity. So Winnie Kinney uh, would be there. Uh, Whittier Birthplace would be there. Uh, the Buttonwoods Museum for years sold those Christmas bulbs. I don't know if they're still selling them this year. It's a good idea to talk about all the kinds of things that are that are being sold locally, uh, but I guess they're not having. I guess the shops were not part of this event. Uh, at least they weren't there with us. I mean, they could be there on a different day because I know that the day after we were there Saturday, the day after they had another event scheduled. So. Okay. That might be the event that went before the license commission. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Nate, while you're there, uh, are you on camera? Uh, I'm not, and I will put myself on camera right now. Put yourself Here on I am. camera. Okay. Uh, Nate listened very carefully, because he's right in the next room, last week uh, to our guest author, Roxanne Dent, was so enamored, he purchased two copies of Roxanne's book, The Twelve Days of Christmas. Bought it on Amazon. Uh, they were shipped to the station. Uh, he paid for this personally. He's keeping one, and he's giving you the other one. I've got that up on the screen now, and I am giving one away. Now, Nate, what kind of contest should we have to award this book? Well, should I think we should do something to the effect of if they were listening... They would have hear, heard a um, couple of names that were mentioned in the book during the story when Roxanne was talking. And I want them to mention, I want them to come up with three main characters in that book. Okay. And, and she mentioned at least three last week. But I think, I'm going to think about which three I want them to come up with. I know one for sure. Well, I'll tell you what. Why don't you just ask them to name any three? Name any three characters that were mentioned in that because book when Roxanne I was here. I have a little cheat. It's right on the, if you already own the book, it's on the back. But there then if go. you already own it, maybe you want to give the book to someone else. So I'll tell you what. We're going to, uh, you can call, list any three of the characters you heard Roxanne mention last week in her reading of The Twelve Days of Christmas, 
and uh, Nate will be the final judge here, but you could win this book. Nate paid for it himself as a gift for our listeners. So why don't you keep that in mind? Still taking January birthdays and anniversaries, call in the name of a recipient. Name will be added and will be drawn uh, the um, end of the month. Also, for a $10 gift certificate, sounds like Marcel is right on the right on the tail of this, so uh, you might want to uh, try out yourself. Uh, Three-part question. Before the Santa Parade started in Haverhill, there was a big activity, a Christmas party. It took place where? That's the first question. Where did it start? And then when it got so big, it had to move to where? Where did it go? Second question. And who played... Santa Claus. Be the first to answer that. You'll receive a $10 gift certificate to Kimball Tavern Antiques. As I said earlier, if you're just joining us, uh, former open mic show Jack Bevilacqua did his holiday shopping at Kimball Tavern Antiques. All right. Um, 978-374-1900. Three prizes out there right now. We're going to take a, a break for Community Spotlight. And when we come back, I'm going to read to you this wonderful letter I received today from a WHAV listener in Maine, of all places. We'll be back with more of the Open Mic Show in just a minute. Open Mic! Tim Coco and the Open Mic will be right back. Get in on the action. Call 978-374-1900 or email tcoco at whav.net. If you are enjoying this program, please consider making a donation right now. Your donations to not-for-profit WHAV help keep these vital community services on the air. Donate online at www.whav.net. This is Phil Christie. Listen to The Wave with fewer interruptions, no pop-ups, and a choice of players by tuning directly from www.whav.net. Community Spotlight! The Haverhill Historical Society is having its 13th annual Festival of Trees. The event runs from November 29th to December 14th. Local businesses and individuals may donate a tree or a wreath and decorations to be raffled off during the event. Proceeds go to the Buttonwood Museum. The event includes a family day with crafts, a visit from Santa, senior day, and various performances. For more information on this event, call 978-374-4626. Someone you know is on WHAV. To submit or read your own nonprofit announcements, click on the contact tab at whav.net or email news at whav.net. In the Edwin V. Johnson Newsroom, this is Martha Melendez. From the Edwin B. Johnson Newsroom, WHAV presents the Open Mic Show with Tim Coco. Make your voice heard. Call 978-374-1900. That's 978-374-1900. Or email tcoco at whav.net. Welcome back to the Open Mic Show, a 50-year staple of democracy in the Merrimack Valley. This hour of the Open Mic Show being brought to you by Haverhill Bank, just one bank. If you're just joining us or otherwise miss this, uh, breaking news during the Open Mic Show, TD Bank, uh, downtown, if you remember, was once Family Bank, was once... Haverhill Savings Bank, uh, but TD Bank in Haverhill apparently lost uh, the data of many customers. It looks like, what, 260,000 customers across the country, but 90,000 in Massachusetts. 
Uh, they have agreed to pay $625,000 in a settlement with Attorney General Martha Coakley's office. Uh, this is breaking news heard first on WHAV. Uh, besides the $625,000, uh, the bank has already paid $200,000 to upgrade its systems uh, to uh, hopefully, I suppose, prevent a breach like this happening. Uh, but in any event, uh, TD Bank in Haverhill uh, put uh, two unencrypted, that means just plain data, uh, uh, disks in a bag for a courier to take to Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, those disks never arrived. Uh, they included Social Security numbers, uh, birthdays, uh, driver's license numbers, and the like. And um, what made it a crime is not that they lost the data, as bad as that might be. What made it a crime was uh, this happened in March 2012, and they did not get around to reporting it to the attorney general's office as required under Massachusetts law until October of 2012. Uh, so some of you who may have received a replacement card and didn't know why, uh, maybe you thought it was something to do with one of the Target breaches or Home Depot breaches, well, it might very well have been the breach uh, at TD Bank. So if you have a comment on data security in our less secure age, uh, call the Open Mic Show, 978 374 1900. There's also a news item our environmental consultant, Jerry, from Methuen, might be interested in, and this relates to Johnson's Pond. It's uh, one of Haverhill's backup water supplies, but physically located uh, mostly in Groveland. A uh, story on WHAV today. Uh, it'll be going, uh, a woman in Groveland uh, apparently found that her uh, deed for her property included certain restrictions required by the city of Haverhill, uh, ostensibly to protect this backup water supply. She is asking the Haverhill City Council to remove those restrictions. We'll know more about that tomorrow night. But it's interesting, uh, Jerry often speaks about these uh, water measures, and um, I'm sure he has something to say about that. Now, let me get to this letter we received. And this is from uh, Tom in, um, in Maine. I, I guess I can use the city. Tom in Gorham, Maine. Uh, he uh, wrote today, I can't begin to tell you how much I enjoy listening to your radio station when I'm in the area. Would you happen to have a bumper sticker from your station that you could send me? I definitely appreciate it and would be very proud to display it. Thank you very, very much, Tom, radio listener and enthusiast. And yes, Tom, we are going to send you uh, that bumper sticker. Uh, and Tom, uh, graciously... Uh, bought a WHAV membership, and uh, we thank Tom very much for that, and it's so good to hear from listeners. We heard from another, um, another listener uh, who's, I guess, uncomfortable with mentioning uh, his name, uh, but he was concerned about the uh, Wavelength story, the WHAV story in the Haverhill Heritage series about Francesco Rocco, the stained glass designer. Apparently, um, uh, Rocco's descendants a little concerned about the story that indicated that he changed the, a word as windows at the Universalist Unitarian Church on Canosa Avenue. Uh, the family is going to try to find some data to uh, refute that their, uh, their, that their uh, ancestor could possibly have done this. I mentioned that I really didn't think they should worry too much. It brought attention to the great national and international works of stained glass maker Francesco, known as Frank Rocco. Uh, but nevertheless, they're going to uh, look into it. Uh, and they suggest that there's maybe more of a mystery. Oh, thank you, Nate, for putting up the photograph on WHAV-TV. Uh, they think there may be more of a mystery. 
And uh, I, I think David Goudswood uh, might have some fun with this. I'm not going to put him really on the spot, but I wonder what his theory might be. Uh, if not Rocco, then who would have changed the word on the um, stained glass at the Universalist Unitarian Church? Uh, we'll talk more about uh, that. I think uh, I'm going to surprise Nate. We're going to actually take our break uh, maybe even a couple seconds early uh, so we can go right to weather. And then we'll come back and talk a little more about uh, this this breakthrough in a um, – you know, 55-year mystery about stained glass windows at the Universalist Unitarian Church. Let's go to local weather. Open mic! Tim Coco and the open mic will be right back. Get in on the action. Call 978-374-1900 or email tcoco at whav.net. If you are enjoying this program, please consider making a donation right now. Your donations to not-for-profit WHAV help keep these vital community services on the air. Donate online at www.whav.net. It's 731. Phil Christie here. Are you listening to WHAV on cable television? If so, join WHAV in thanking the board, staff, and members of your local public access channel. Catch the wave! The most trusted man in America, news anchor Walter Cronkite, once said, It is absolutely essential in a democracy to have competition in the media. A lot of competition. That sentiment is one of the driving forces behind WHAV's expanded local news effort. This is News Director Dana Esmail inviting you to listen to my hourly weekday newscast right here on WHAV. You'll also find the area's most comprehensive local news reporting at whav.net on your computer or smartphone. Remember, WHAV is the only Haverhill-based news source, and it's always free. And that's the way it is. Wave weather! I'm WHAV meteorologist Gary Best with wave weather. A chance of snow showers developing across the Merrimack Valley during the night. Temperatures steady or rising through the night. And then we're looking at a light mix early Tuesday morning becoming rain though, then rain heavy at times. During the afternoon, the winds pick up. High temperature in mid to upper 30s. Rain showers at night in the 30s and a chance of showers on Wednesday. Temperatures up near 40. I'm Gary Best. Your next wave weather coming up in 30 minutes. From the Edwin B. Johnson Newsroom, WHAV presents the Open Mic Show with Tim Coco. Make your voice heard. Call 978-374-1900. That's 978-374-1900. Or email tcoco at whav.net. Welcome back to the Open Mic Show. Uh, now, this hour of the Open Mic Show is being brought to you by the Merrimack Valley Economic Development Council. Smart companies choose the Merrimack Valley. And as I, I say this uh, frequently, but if you want to know what's going on in this time of year, there are so many events if you want a quick guide to everything that's going on throughout the Merrimack Valley, from Greater Lowell uh, to Greater Haverhill to Greater Newburyport, uh, then then visit MerrimackValley.info, MerrimackValley.info. Click on the icon for Merrimack Valley Happenings, and you can look at a the most complete listing of events I think you'll see anywhere. And it's updated every week, comes out every Tuesday. And you can even sign up to have it go to your email box so you don't have to check it manually. So that's something. Uh, here's some news from Haverhill Mayor James J. Fiorentini. Uh, Mayor Fiorentini delivered holiday baskets donated by Market Basket uh, today to families displaced by the fire on Nickel Street back in November. There were three families in attendance, and all of the residents have secured alternative housing. Uh, the mayor said, losing all of your belongings is terrible. Losing them this time of year is even worse. 
I'm thankful there were no injuries to the residents and that they were able to find new housing. When I called Market Basket to get the donations, they stepped up and donated the baskets. I appreciate the partnership we have with Market Basket and value their commitment to the residents of our city. You know, uh, Market Basket and the mayor just never uh, stop amazing me. Uh, Such giving people. So Market Basket steps up with the baskets, as we would expect uh, the Demoas family to do, or at least the, the good side of the Demoas family. And the mayor, his thoughtfulness in asking and then actually uh, handing them out today. Uh, we actually may have some photographs of those baskets, and we'll try to show those uh, in, in just a bit. So breaking news on open mic tonight, uh, we have this story. We also have uh, the big bank breach. Oh, that'll be fun. Well, that's what we'll call it, the big bank breach story. Uh, TD Bank. It's Haverhill, or at least one of its Haverhill offices, uh, ha- is going to pay $625,000 to uh, the attorney general's office. And actually, it's going to be used for consumer purposes. We'll uh, get to that. It was posted to WHAV.net's uh, news uh, sections uh, just before the open mic show went on the air. Uh, but uh, but essentially, uh, 90,000 Massachusetts residents, uh, 260,000 nationwide, uh, uh, potentially lost uh, their identification or identifying information. Uh, apparently, there were two uh, disks of data being moved from Haverhill to Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, the disks were not encrypted, in other words, not secured. Uh, so if uh, I don't know if they would work in an ordinary computer, but I'm sure the people who uh, deal in uh, this kind of property know how to use it, unfortunately. And so this information included Social Security numbers and birth dates and so on, driver's licenses, and it was lost. The disks never made it to Springfield. Now, that's not the illegal part, although who knows what became of those disks. The illegal part was that in March 2012, TD Bank had an obligation to notify the attorney general uh, under Massachusetts law of this potential data breach. Uh, They didn't get around to doing that until October 2012. Apparently, investigations took place and some uh, some court hearings, and today uh, TD Bank must pay six hundred twenty-five thousand uh, dollars. That is uh, pretty pretty big news uh, for those of us who are concerned about our identities, about the theft of our data. You know, I I wonder if George Orwell were still alive, uh, whether he might have renamed his book 1984 and renamed it 2014, uh, because almost everything he's worried about, um, surveillance cameras, uh, listening to our telephone conversations, everything that is electronic seems to be putting us at risk of our privacy. Maybe you have a thought about that. I know a few years ago when um, there was talk about putting cameras uh, at the rest area on Route 110 uh, on the Haverhill-Methuen line, uh, one of our listeners, I think it was Brian, said it wouldn't bother him if the cameras were there. Uh, I asked listeners what they thought, and I guess most people aren't too worried about being watched. Um, But your private financial data, I guess that is uh, something else again. Call 978-374-1900. Have your voice be heard right here on the Open Mic Show. Let's just see if there's any other uh, comments. I don't see any just yet. Let's go back to our prizes. We're taking birthday wishes and anniversary wishes for January. We're taking them now. Uh call the open mic show wish someone a happy birthday wish a couple a happy anniversary and um, their name will be placed into the hat for drawing at the end of the month the winner receives a free seven inch cake freshly baked cake i might add 
from LBD's second generation Italian bakery. You know, oftentimes I leave out that second generation part, so I, I wanted to look at it more carefully to make sure, but that's important. Here's a family that's been in the baking business for more than 50 years, and now they're in Haverhill, 140 South Main Street, Bradford, LBD's second generation Italian bakery. They provide the cake baked uh, to your specifications, either vanilla or chocolate. The recipient will receive a letter from WHAV indicating that they have won the cake. Uh, they call the bakery, order the cake, and when they go to pick it up, instead of cash, you just present this letter. So there's no reason why you shouldn't uh, wish someone a happy birthday or a happy anniversary. So you do that right now. Trivia question from our friends at Kimball Tavern Antiques, corner of Salem and South Main Streets in Bradford. This is a timely question. It's a three-part uh, trivia question. Before the Santa Parade started in Haverhill 50 years ago, there was a big event that took place. It took place originally where? First question, where did it start? It became so successful and popular, it had to move to a bigger location, which was the second question. Either way, name the person who played Santa Claus at those events. You could win a $10 gift certificate from Kimball Tavern Antiques. And Nathan E. Webster the third, open mic show producer, um, I don't know why they say these things about him, but he reached into his own pocket, and he bought two copies of Roxanne Dent's book, The Twelve Days of Christmas. If you were watching or listening last week, Roxanne Dent read from the book. Nate was so enamored by the story, really, he wanted to know how it ended. So he bought, he bought two copies. He's giving one to you. Okay, Nate, what do they have to do again? They have to name three characters. Name any three characters that we can verify quickly, any three characters from the book. Uh, if you were listening last week, and you should have been, name any three characters, and you win a copy of The Twelve Days of Christmas by Roxanne Dent. Incidentally, I really enjoyed Roxanne on the program last week, and she was so generous. I had mentioned two weeks ago uh, that I was... Uh, for some reason, craving British clotted cream. I remembered having it when uh, visiting uh, England several times. And um, David Goudswood helped out two weeks ago telling me what it was called in this country, uh, Devonshire cream. Uh, but Roxanne Dan took it one step further and brought us scones, uh, plum jam, I think it was, and a, um, a marmalade uh, fruity uh, spread, clotted cream, and a couple of scones. Nate had one. It was really good, wasn't it? So uh, really nice, very nice uh, person. Let's go to the phones. You're on the open mic show. Uh, how you doing? Good. How are you? <laughs> oh, hang it in. I heard my name. Yeah, well, you know, I uh, I seeded a little bit. <laughs> yeah. How do you feel about security these days? Well, <laughs> you know, there are more risks now, more than ever. Uh, you heard you heard what I mentioned, right? That I think it was, it was you that wasn't too concerned about a camera in a park, right? No, I'd recommend it because uh, consider the fact that uh, the park is a public place. It's not like uh, you're having a camera being placed in your house to watch you, although people are doing that, too, huh? <laughs> I guess that's coming, isn't it? <laughs> and I suppose, considering what you've been through, you might like the idea yourself. Uh, yeah, well, as a matter of fact, yeah. I mean, it couldn't hurt, I mean. <laughs> but yeah. then again, you know, it could be that uh, the, whoever took the, the, the safe would have known about the cameras and would have avoided them or shut them off or done whatever yes unfortunate any any word on that yet uh no the investigation continues 
Yeah. Now, you know, Nate was just commenting that uh, on this TD Bank story that uh, this was two years ago that all of this happened and then was reported, and he was curious, why, what took so long? And I guess uh, the wheels of justice indeed roll very slowly, don't they? Well, they probably kept on trying to figure out what happened and how to recover the data before um, reporting it to the Attorney General, I uh, guess. I mean, I, I, you know, we hear about these things all the time, but what made this kind of an interesting story was that it's in Haverhill that they hand the disks off to a courier. Uh, they didn't explain who the courier was or what happened to the courier. Yeah, what did the courier have to say about all this? Yeah, and uh, so we'll probably try to follow up. I have a sneaking suspicion that uh, someone walked by that they mistook for the courier and just handed off the data of uh, 260,000 people. Mm. <laughs> but uh, I suppose that might be a bit embarrassing to admit, if that's the case. I sure think so, <laughs> yeah. So, and unencrypted at that, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, incredible. So, I mean, if you transmit um, legal data back and forth between your attorney, uh, you know, that's supposed to be encrypted. Right. Matter of fact, if you send an email to the bank asking a question about your account, uh, any response you get from the bank has to be encrypted. Yep. Now it's a. Uh, it's, I just find it an incredible age, and as you know, I suppose WHAV is a beneficiary of all of this technology because we send data out every day um, because the internet is our primary distribution vehicle. Right. And even when the new uh, FM station goes on the air, uh, more than likely we're going to send the signal from the studio to that transmitter digitally. So I guess we're all in this together. We are. All right. So any other uh, thoughts from our uh, conversations tonight? Uh, no, not a whole lot. Um, I spoke to a person today who was uh, interested in organizing a fundraiser for me. Oh, good, I because I... have uh, WHAV.net. What's that? I don't want to compete with WHAV.net. Well, I'll tell you what. Um, you know, we have been working somewhat quietly behind the scenes, uh, but if uh, your friend uh, wants to use the facilities of WHAV to get the word out, uh, that would take us a lot closer to where I want it to be with this by now. So feel free to give them my name and email. And, um, yeah, it's a, it's a terrible, uh, terrible tragedy. If our, any of our listeners uh, aren't sure what we're talking about, uh, Brian's uh, suffered the loss of, uh, correct me if I forget a detail, but uh, his life savings uh, in bonds and other financial documents that were kept in a safe um, those documents are gone, and the safe is gone. And Haverhill Police, was it Benedetti, Detective Benedetti, looking Detective into Benedetti's this? Benedetti's working on the case, yeah. And um, so there's, um, you know, there, there may well be a breakthrough, but, um, you know, that doesn't help Ryan right now. No. No, no but it's a triple loss. I lost my wife, my life savings, and... Uh, and what, oh, one more, which was one of the um, the people who uh, still needs to be questioned is away and hard to find, just dropped out of sight. Yeah, you know, this has been an incredible year, and, um, you know, it's not often that we have the opportunity to, to speak to the people who are in the news. So I, I, I don't want it to sound at all callous that... Um, you know, we've been following uh, Brian for quite some time, uh, mostly because he calls this show. <laughs> but, um, you know, his uh, boyhood home was torn down, and, and om that almost cost him um, money because the, the city uh, condemned it while it was under agreement to be sold. And if the, if the house hadn't ultimately been sold, Brian would have been on the hook for the demolition costs. And as Brian, I think, correctly pointed out, you know, some shrubbery and paint, uh, the city probably never would have looked at that house. Um, and that's, that's one. 
And then uh, his wife, who suffered for many years, uh, multiple sclerosis. Is that right, Brian? Yep. And uh, she was also blind. Is that right? She was blind since birth. Yep. B- blind since birth. And I, you know, I, I guess I don't, I don't know. I'm told that you have not been blind all your life, but you are blind now. Is that right? That's true. Yep. All right. So um, you had sight. Um, and so then all of this happens, and then his life savings, uh, which is, uh, I guess, in the form of bonds and, and other financial instruments. Cash. Oh, cash, <laughs> it too? <was> cash. <laughs> well, I, um, Most of it was cash. I, I, um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but maybe there's a, a lesson there. Uh, maybe. Well, there is. And <laughs> the thing is, the only reason that I kept a bunch of cash there was uh, if it were to show up in an account someplace that um, my wife wouldn't be eligible for certain services. Oh, I understand now. Actually, now I understand perfectly. And I remember the banker saying, you know, if something happens to this, it's not insured, you know. And I said, I understand that, but blah, 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 you know. You know, that's I never un- thought in my wildest nightmares that uh, anything like this would happen. No, actually, that's a that's a, a very good explanation because uh, that does make sense. I mean, I think we all know people who may have a, um, unfortunately, a parent going into a nursing home, and everything that that uh, that parent has worked for uh, will likely end up being paid to the nursing home or Medicaid, and. Um, takes away the the dignity of the individual sure so it makes a lot of people do have to find ways to shelter their 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 money and you know in most of these cases and even in, in your case brian you know the one percent would would think this was pocket change uh but for you it's everything oh yeah it uh, is it certainly is and uh and so you know i i really want to stay where i am but uh I may not be able to, but we'll see. Well, plus, you know, what I don't know is if the IRS is going to come after me uh, to pay taxes on the money that I don't have anymore. I don't know how that works. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm hoping your attorney does. Of course, you have to pay the attorney. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> uh, this, you know, this is, um, you know, sort of gallows humor, I'm sorry, but it's uh, it really just... It's just a terrible tragedy. So I really hope um, uh, this person you're talking about will contact us and we'll do something more formally together. Well, I've been she, kind of... Uh, she's given me permission to, uh, you know, uh, invite people who are willing to help to give her a call. All right. I mean, uh, uh, on the air? Well, I wouldn't give it out on the air, but... Oh, okay. All right. So... Um, i give it to you, though, Tim. Yeah. Could you... Uh, either send it to me or call back and leave the information with Nate. Yep. And that way we can get started on this. I, I suppose I have uh, naively been hoping uh, that uh, the detectives could find this very quickly, and maybe they ultimately will. Um, well, they get assignments thrown at them too, you know, and so they have to drop one case and focus on another, you know. So. There's just not enough time in the day to do now, everything they need to do. You know, that's interesting. Uh, someone commented, maybe you saw it on Facebook, uh, someone commented that, um, you know, WHAV shouldn't give so much uh, information, uh, positive information about police drug busts and, and crime uh, breakups as, as WHAV does. And... Um, a number of people commented on it. Um, the person thought we were hyping uh, for the benefit of the police. I wonder if it was the drug dealer who co- criticized. <laughs> oh, oh, I don't know. Oh, yeah, actually, actually, wouldn't that be funny if that's if the motivation was? But uh, no, I don't think that was the case. But you know, it is. It does present some difficult issues about news because is merely reporting. And frankly, it's almost every day that WHAV has one story or another about the drug trade uh, that's going on here. And we, you know, there's been some connection to uh, another news story in Bradford this weekend, although WHAV is waiting for confirmation from the district attorney's office before doing any of that kind of speculation. Uh, But there's... um, Anytime you see uh, in the obituaries on WHAV every day, you see a young 
person. I suppose it's the cynical side of me um, thinks, oh, maybe it was drugs. Well, you're not alone, Tim. Uh, I mean, you know, when I see a young person, and unless they say something about a particular uh, disease or something, it makes me wonder. And frankly, well, drugs, yeah, I suppose, because I think in terms of suicide when I look at something like that. And you don't too often see that in an obituary, so-and-so took his own life. I mean, on rare occasions you will, but... Yeah, yeah, that... Um, yeah, I, I, I have to say, uh, one family actually put in the, um, the death notice uh, that it was their uh, son's struggle with addiction. Yeah. And I thought that that was, uh, that was positive. And I know a lot of families are embarrassed by this, but, you know, if they can save one life. And so my, I guess uh, back, back to my point, I, I believe WHAV has an obligation uh, to report um, all of these drug busts, no matter how, how large or small. Right. And uh, actually, we had kind of a, uh, let me, uh, let me uh, end that part by, with a, a kind of a, a, a lighter uh, a lighter note, and I hope Detective uh, Lieutenant Pistoni is listening. Um, we had a story last week, and you know, how many, how many times can you run a drug story running a picture of the police station or the courthouse or, or uh, you know, uh, a desk filled with drug paraphernalia? So we were looking uh, for some other kind of graphic to use last week, and so we ran a graphic of Lieutenant Pistoni with the story. Yeah. And the headline said, you know, man arrested with 100 counts of drug dealing or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I guess some people jumped to the conclusion <laughs> that it was Robert Pristoni. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, he, he wrote to me over the weekend, asked me to change that photo, and uh, I complied. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, uh, it, was, it was innocent, but... It's one of the day-to-day -day, uh, funny parts of news gathering. Is you, you know, most people don't understand that why would a radio station need pictures? Well, because we have a website. <laughs> right. So, Everybody's got websites nowadays. Yeah, so, you know, we, we needed some artwork. We thought, you know, um, Lieutenant Pistoni is the spokesperson for the police department. He's the one that gives out all the information, and, and no one knows what he looks like or not. <laughs> I'm not everyone, so we put his picture with the story. Yeah. And the poor guy got accused <laughs> by readers of being uh, the bandit. <laughs> <laughs> so apologies to you, Lieutenant Pistoni. Uh, but no, anyway. That's Captain Pistoni. What's that? Captain Pistoni. I thought he was a lieutenant. Oh, no, no. He's captain. All right, so Brian is in the know. Oh, well, right. I think he's the head detective over there. Yeah, and, uh, you know, very busy. And I guess with um, uh, the re we've had a couple of retirements uh, in uh, among the senior staff. Um, you know, of course, how soon we forget. Captain... Um, <laughs> Ready? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, retired, so... Um, so we've had we've you know uh, I, I guess we just put a lot of uh, a lot of officers through uh, the academy, but they won't be ready to fill those shoes for a while. Mm -hmm. But it, it's amazing how fast uh, they do move through the ranks. Uh, I remember when I first covered police uh, for WHAV uh, thirty-five or more years ago. Uh, you'd see these names. And then uh, all these years later, you still see those names, but they're not the same people. They're the sons and grandchildren. That's right, yeah. So it's, uh, it's kind of interesting <laughs> that, you know, you know, not all that much changes. <laughs> you know what I got a kick out of is uh, when the police station was uh, up on Summer Street. Yes. Uh, I remember pictures of police officers on the wall from, like, 18-whatever. You know, and they all had beards. Oh, yeah, I wonder what happened to those. Are they at the new station? I hope they are. Yeah, that's interesting. That's very interesting. You're right. There was some, you know, with the um, uh, with the, the brass buttons up and down. Yeah. No ties. They were right, right to the collar, at least the early ones. The later ones probably had ties. And, of course, I always wonder about stupid little things. I'm glad you raised this. You'll bring us to news. 
for years, I'm, and I don't know if there are any around now abandoned, but I'm sure you remember these. There were these little phone boxes on different phone poles around the city. Yep. And uh, I guess well, people the, didn't have telephones then. All right, so the the police would go to one of these boxes, uh, unlock it, take out the phone, and call something in. Yep. And then we got police radio, which, by the way, hey, Brian, what was the call letters of the Haverhill Police Radio Station? Um, KBC, blah, 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 I don't know. Well, that was the later one. But the original call letters of the Haverhill Police Department was Here w- comes the trivia question. WHAV. Is that right? Because in 1946, when the Gazette was preparing to put its radio station on the air, WHAV, they couldn't get those call letters oh. because the police had them. And the, back then, the same you know, four-letter calls were used. Uh-huh. So uh, the Haverhill Gazette got another one called uh, WHGF, Haverhill Gazette Frequency, who knows. Oh. Um, but know the police chief Lynch agreed to trade. He did. So that's how we got our WHAV. Don't you just love this? I love that, yeah. This well, see, stuff. and I can't remember back past uh, Chief Ross. So. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I do know what you mean about those um, KCF whatever numbers. I don't even yeah. know if they use those anymore. No, probably not. I think they're scrambling the police frequencies now. I'm not. Well, I believe they are because I remember you know, listening to them on scanners and such like that. And uh, and it was kind of interesting. And and I happened to be present uh, one time when uh, there was a police officer who reported uh, at an accident where a bunch of teenage boys were killed. And it was at the uh, intersection of 110 and 108, you know, Newton Road. Okay. And uh, all the uh, the kids in the car were dead, and I could just hear the shakiness in the uh, officer's voice as he called it in. Yeah, you know, that is, uh, and I can understand why in some cases that they don't want to put that out over the air. I believe Haverhill Fire still uses open frequencies uh, from what our news department uh, can gather. Uh-huh. Um, I just hope there's no abuse of these um, of these um, scrambled waves to keep news from reaching people. All oh, right. You know, I had... Well, uh, I don't want interference from the public, you know. Well, I asked... Um, I asked someone at the police department about, because now we're going to go over news a little over time, but r- real quick. Rebecca Foster. That's right. <laughs> Since you've said that, I can't, every time I hear her now, I have to listen to her say her name. <laughs> but um, there was uh, two stories um, that I wondered about um, that WHAV had. One was a pedestrian was hit, and the police never identified the pedestrian, and I wanted to know who? Because usually there's a reason. If someone isn't identified, you know, it's, um, I'm joking, folks, I'm joking, you know, some elected official that was drunk in the street, you know, uh, so, yeah. so they don't want to release the name. I don't think that was the case, but we never did find out uh. who the pedestrian was. And the other story was, you might remember this, there was a, um, uh, a, a gentleman, I believe, who collapsed in a rowboat on Plug Pond and had to be uh, rescued by um, a younger occupant of the boat. Mm-hmm. And, well, in the old days, we would have told you who that was. Right. And we would have been told who it was. Well, m- we never got that information. And I, so I, I worry that if we're not getting some of the simpler ones, and again, in my mind, uh, the, the, the person who uh, fell over in the boat, this is probably not true, but you, your mind runs wild, Okay, so which city councilor had too much to drink while boating? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that might not be true, but you really information gets rid of the suspicions. Well, I know that sometimes they'll withhold the name because they want to notify the family. That's right, and I think that's the case going on right now in Bradford. Yeah, uh, with the the autopsy that's been ordered. Uh, WHAB had the autopsy news this morning. So, and you'll hear about it in about a second. Oh, yeah. Well, Brian, I, uh, please call Nate back with that information. Oh, well. We Again, I, I, I strayed off, but I've been kind of behind the scenes uh, hoping against hope that, uh, that the money was back in your hands. Well, I was too, but <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> 
Yeah, I know. You can and now you get to play George Bailey at the end of the movie. It's a Wonderful Life, right? Merry Christmas, everybody. Yes. Yeah, so every time a bell rings, what? <laughs> An angel gets its wings. <laughs> Very Not good. Boy, Clarence. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's a good ending for this segment. All right, okay. thank thank you, Brian. Take care. Take care. Bye. All right, we're going to go to local news with news director Dana Esmo. Local weather, and uh, I don't know, is Rebecca Foster on from National News? We'll see if Brian's right. Uh, We'll be back with more of the Open Mic Show after that. Open Mic! Tim Coco and the Open Mic will be right back. Get in on the action. Call 978-374-1900 or email tcoco at whav.net. If you are enjoying this program, please consider making a donation right now. Your donations to not-for-profit WHAV help keep these vital community services on the air. Donate online at www.whav.net. It's 8.05. WHAV Merrimack Valley. WHAV is a not-for-profit service of Public Media of New England, Incorporated. It's heard on 1640 AM, the web, at whav.net and participating cable television stations. Here's what's happening in local news. Autopsies are due to be performed as part of an ongoing state police investigation into the, quote, unattended deaths of a Haverhill couple found unresponsive in a Lamal Avenue home Saturday morning by their young children. Carrie Kimball Monahan, spokesperson for Essex District Attorney Jonathan Blodgett, told WHAV the identities of a 36-year-old woman and a 39-year-old man are being withheld as the deaths occurred inside their home, and at this time, there is no criminal issue involved. Foul play is not suspected at this time, and um, the cause and manner of death would be determined by the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner in Boston, uh, who will perform an autopsy and toxicology screens as a standard procedure to determine the cause and manner of death. And Kimball Monahan said the Department of Children and Families have placed the children, ages 10 and 8, in the custody of a grandmother whom the children contacted first. As is standard practice, a Department of Children and Families is notified when you know children are involved in a situation like this. And uh, fortunately, the grandmother uh, was able to come to the home and meet with the the social workers from DCF, and she now has custody of the children. Again, an investigation by state police assigned to District Attorney Blodgett's office is ongoing. According to Kimball Monahan, it could take, quote, quite some time before final autopsy results are completed. The Haverhill City Council on Tuesday will consider a Groveland property owner's request that the city release its rights regarding water flow from the property situated near Johnson's Pond, a backup drinking water source. According to city documents, property owner Dorner Kasky is requesting the city execute a release deed for its interests in property on Washington Street, Groveland, near the Boxford town line. The proposed action would change language of a property deed which allows the city to regulate, quote, flowage or any other obligations to observe the rules and regulations of the Water Department of the City of Haverhill, end quote. A letter to the City Council from Deputy Haverhill Public Works Director Robert E. Ward, Water Division Superintendent, makes no objection to the non-monetary consideration. The Haverhill City Council meets at 7 p.m. Tuesday in Council Chambers at Haverhill City Hall. A Fitchburg man is accused of shoplifting Saturday evening from a store at the Westgate Shopping Plaza, 400 Lowell Avenue, Haverhill. Police report 39-year-old Matthew Moore of Fitchburg was arrested shortly before 6 p.m. Saturday on a charge of shoplifting by concealment. He is due to be arraigned in Haverhill District Court. In local high school sports, no scheduled matches on Monday for the Haverhill Hillies. Remember, WHAV is the only Haverhill-based news source, and it's always free. In the Edwin V. Johnson Newsroom, this is Dana Esmail.
From Feature Story News in Washington, I'm Rebecca Foster. The U.S. Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel says the U.S. will not be reviewing its operations to free American hostages despite the failure of recent missions. American journalist Luke Summers and South African teacher Pierre Corky were killed by al-Qaeda in Yemen during a U.S.-led operation on Saturday. Kate Fisher reports from Washington. Saturday's botched mission was the third failed rescue attempt of a U.S. hostage in the past six months. Chuck Hagel has defended it, saying such raids were risky but that there was no need for a policy review because the process is about as thorough as it can be. This is uh, further evidence of uh, America's continued commitment uh, to always find its uh, American hostages no matter where they are and make every effort to get those hostages returned. Last month, the White House said President Obama had ordered a review of U.S. policy on freeing American hostages, but said he still opposed the payment of ransoms. A long-awaited congressional report criticizing the CIA's use of harsh interrogation methods is due out imminently. Concerns are already being raised. It could lead to a backlash by Islamic militant groups. Here's FSN's Verity Gear. The report, which is a summary of a 6,000-page study, is expected to be released this week. It's the first public account of the CIA's alleged use of torture on suspected al-Qaeda detainees held in secret facilities in Europe and Asia in the years following the 9-11 attacks. Republicans have warned the release of this report could trigger violence and deadly retaliation. The report's expected to detail the agency's use of waterboarding, sleep deprivation and humiliation, among other techniques. While the Secretary of State, John Kerry has urged the senator in charge of the report to reconsider the timing of the release. The Obama administration say they support it. Meanwhile, U.S. diplomatic and military posts overseas are being put on alert over a potential backlash. On his first visit to Washington, Britain's Prince William is urging world leaders to join the battle against the illegal trade in wildlife. He said organized criminal gangs now dominate the trade, and he said it poses a threat to global security. Simon Marks reports. Prince William spoke at the World Bank shortly after a White House meeting with President Obama. He says he's creating a task force to stop the transport industry from being unwittingly sucked in to the illegal trade in wildlife. Private sector actors are often ignorant of the role they play in the trade chain. If we are to crack down on wildlife crime, this trade must be stifled. He said organised gangs make $20 billion a year from the wildlife trade and he said he's not willing to let his children grow up in a world where iconic species are under threat. From bureaus worldwide, this is FSN. Wave weather! I'm WHAV meteorologist Gary Best with wave weather. A chance of snow showers developing across the Merrimack Valley during the night. Temperatures steady or rising through the night. And then we're looking at a light mix early Tuesday morning becoming rain though, then rain heavy at times. During the afternoon, the winds pick up. High temperature in mid to upper 30s. Rain showers at night in the 30s and a chance of showers on Wednesday. Temperatures up near 40. I'm Gary Best. Your next wave weather coming up in 30 minutes. Phil Christie here. Last year, WHAV helped local nonprofits by airing 8,780 community spotlight messages. Only local radio can bring you this level of public service, but only WHAV does. From the Edwin B. Johnson Newsroom, WHAV presents the Open Mic Show with Tim Coco. Make your voice heard. Call 978-374-1900. That's 978-374-1900. Or email tcoco at whav.net. Once again, this hour of the Open Mic Show is being brought to you by the Merrimack Valley Economic Development Council. Smart companies choose the Merrimack Valley. 
Go to MerrimackValley.info to learn more about the Merrimack Valley Economic Development Council. And while you're there, click on the Merrimack Valley Happenings button, and you'll be able to look at the most complete list of events happening around this time. Actually, uh, the list is updated every week, every Tuesday. So you'll see uh, throughout the year uh, things you can do, where to get tickets, many free events, exhibits, tours, and the like. So that might be something interesting for you. Okay, we've got uh, three prizes outstanding here. Let's see uh, if we can't move toward this. Uh, We're taking January birthdays and anniversaries. Very simple. Call the open mic show, 978-374-1900. Wish someone a happy birthday who's having a birthday in January, or wish a couple a happy anniversary. Uh, The recipient's name will be added uh, to literally the hat and um, will draw the winner at the end of the month. And the winner receives a free 7-inch cake choice of chocolate or vanilla from LBD's second-generation Italian bakery, 140 South Main Street on the Bradford side of the river. I guess that is the term I'm using, Bradford side of the river, uh, since I have not received any um, suggestions from you, my listeners, about, um, is it the former town of Bradford, the South Haverhill, the Bradford District, which is what its legal name is, the Bradford District of Haverhill, the Bradford neighborhood, although people in Ward Hill will be upset, uh, and that's another another town that's not, (laughs) Ward Hill. Uh, So maybe you have a a suggestion on that. Also, to receive a $10 gift certificate to Kimball Tavern Antiques, corner of Salem and South Main Streets, as I mentioned earlier, former open mic show host Jack Bevilacqua did his Christmas shopping there. And you can get a $10 gift certificate if you can answer three questions, all related. Before the Santa Parade started in Haverhill 50 years ago, there was another big event that took place. It took place where? That's the first question. Where did it begin? That's the first question. Then it got so big and popular it had to move. Where did it go? That's the second question. And either way, who played Santa Claus at these Christmas parties? Be the first to answer that question, and you will receive a uh, $10 gift certificate to Kimball Tavern Antiques. All right, on uh, WHAV News tomorrow and on the website as soon as possible, uh, we're going to provide some information about a fundraiser uh, to benefit uh, listener Brian, who you just heard before the news, uh, who lost uh, his life savings to theft. Uh, We're going to see what we can do to help him. Uh, We know that people are are particularly generous this time of year. I know that there are many who are generous all through the year, uh, but this is a, a, a particularly... A sad case, and we hope that you'll be able to help. I believe we have a call. You're on the open mic show. You do like giving me the difficult questions, don't you? Which one did I ask this time? Uh, the stained glass mystery. Oh, yes, yes. Well, you know, I uh, I guess the family was somewhat offended uh, that their relative possibly would do the stained glass equivalent of graffiti. Um, but, um, you well, know... You know, I went looking, and there is no variable translation that would include the word head. And no. I can't imagine that somebody with the name Rocco in that time period would not know their song. No. So no. basically, you got two. You got three choices basically at this point. One, it was in the original comic piece, and nobody caught it, and he left it there because what better irony? No, absolutely. I'm not. I'm not sure about that one. I would. I. I don't know. Since we don't know what the glass looked like, I don't see pictures of the crack. I don't see pictures of the original. I don't see pictures of the replace. So because of that, it's uh, you know it's all hypothetical. Hypothetical. Uh, isn't it nice when your mouth just shuts down entirely on a big words? No, that's a nervous. Um, well, no. here's here's the story. I'll repeat it for listeners who may okay. have missed it. Around 1960, Rocco was commissioned to assemble the Eucharist windows 
to the left and right of the 1947 Stover windows at the Universalist Unitarian Church. Now, let's see, in 1960, I believe that's when the, that's when the Universalists merged with the Unitarians, officially. Although the Unitarians had been renting space for some time, since 1926, when they, uh, well, I guess they ran out of money and had to leave what is now uh, the St. Gregory, the Illuminator building on uh, Main Street. In any event, while working on the new windows, Rocco was asked to repair a crack across the head of one of the figures uh, in his, um, um, uh, I don't know what the word is, uh, his mentor's windows. I would say competitor at that point, but. <clears throat> well, the, the, they kind of argue that that's not a good term. So we'll say mentor, competitor, uh, conic, 1923 windows. So um, the local craftsman made the repair, but apparently worked in a wisecrack. That's what the story says. We uh, don't use the word crack when talking about glass makers. That's bad. Oh, I suppose. Maybe that was um, subtle there. In any event, uh, the original prayers on the window said, Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. And apparently it was changed, according to church officials, Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your head, all ye that hope in the Lord. Uh, oh, you know, it's a very, it's a, it's a psalm. So basically anybody who was going to church would have known the psalm. So I, I propose there are three choices. It was the original mistake by Connick that nobody had noticed. Two, it was a mistake because there was an apprentice who didn't know his psalms. Yeah, I asked that question. And the crack by that point was big enough that either a sliver of glass had fallen out, or the letters had in RT had been so distorted or missing that he just thought it looked like a D. Or Rocco was getting even. Well, I mean, and I don't think it's an offensive story. The, ch the church certainly uh, rather enjoys the irony of it. They've never complained. They haven't changed it. Um, but I, I suppose there are sensitivities uh, on these kinds of things. So we're going to oh, see. That's a genealogy mindset. A good scandal is worth a thousand nice guys. Well, I. Mean, I there made that a argument too. There's genealogist out there who wouldn't want somebody hung in a horse seat. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, I, I, well, I'll just leave it at that. I agree with you. Hey, David, can you hold one second while we do Community Spotlight? We'll keep you on the phone. All right. All right. Uh, David's going to uh, hold, and um, we're going to go to Community Spotlight to make sure we get that in, and then we'll be right back with more of the Open Mic Show. Mike. Tim Coco and the Open Mic will be right back. Get in on the action. Call 978-374-1900 or email tcoco at whav.net. If you are enjoying this program, please consider making a donation right now. Your donations to not-for-profit WHAV help keep these vital community services on the air. Donate online at www.whav.net. Still not sure when your favorite features are broadcast? Check out the What's On page at www.whav.net for complete listings. Catch the wave! On the next Making Contact. That's why our administration has moved aggressively to secure our borders more by hiring a record number of new border guards. By Over 6,000 migrant deaths were recorded on the U.S. side of the border with Mexico between 1998 and 2013. That's an average of more than one a day, every day for 15 years. The true number of deaths is probably much higher. Well, people have no idea what these poor you know, souls are doing out here, you know, and what they're actually encountering. On this edition of Making Contact, we travel to Brooks County in South Texas and look at the human cost of border enforcement strategies in the documentary, Deadly Divide, Migrant Death on the Border. Making Contact is heard every Wednesday night at 6.30. Remember, only local radio can bring you such compelling features, but only WHAV does. Community Spotlight!
The Haverhill Public Library's Book Club Get Lit is meeting Thursday, December 18th at 7 p.m. at the Barking Dog Ale House, 77 Washington Street, Haverhill. The club is aimed at 20 and 30-something-year-olds who will be discussing Beautiful You by Chuck Palahniuk. For more information or to register online, visit HaverhillPL.org under Calendar of Events or call 978-373-1586. Someone you know is on WHAV. To submit or read your own nonprofit announcements, click on the contact tab at WHAV.net or email news at WHAV.net. In the Edwin V. Johnson Newsroom, this is Martha Melendez. From the Edwin B. Johnson Newsroom, WHAV presents the Open Mic Show with Tim Coco. Make your voice heard. Call 978-374-1900. That's 978-374-1900. Or email tcoco at whav.net. And we're back on the Open Mic Show. Uh, on the phone is noted local Haverhill author, David oh, like Goudswood. Yes. And David Goudswood, of course, also has some books that would make excellent holiday gifts. He didn't ask me to do this. Uh, Why, as- yes, now that you mention it, they would indeed make a lovely Christmas gift. So actually, the, the easiest way you can do this, and I hope it's up to date, you can go to whav.net. Let me just uh, do this right in front of you here. Go to whav.net. Uh, go to membership, and you actually don't have to be a member. Uh, go down to members shop, and then you'll see a list of local authors, and I think the most prolific among them is David Goudswood. Well, you know, boys got to keep busy. All right, so let's look at the David Godswood page uh, so we can uh, share this because it's timely. All right, we have H.P. Lovecraft in the Merrimack Valley, Ancient Stone Sites of New England, and the debate over early European exploration. We if, have. If I, may distri- if I may break into your sales pitch just for a brief moment, <laughs> okay. I have a funny story about that book. All right. I was just I just got an invitation to do a talk on one of the sites featured in Ancient Stone Sites. And they want to know when I can get there. The uh, talk would be at the Union Maine Historical Society meeting. Oh? I don't mind doing it, but nobody wants to pay for the commute. Oh, yes, that's the problem with uh, historical societies and nonprofits. Uh, Woody, your birthplace has the same problem every year. We'll find that someone has written a great book. Well, I'm working on that problem. That's right. You're working on it, too. Uh, David has some great ideas. As a matter of fact, uh, you left me a message today, which I found rather humorous. And uh, I, um, I'm hoping it's a true story just because it's a fun one. <laughs> well, but, it, it, I, I think I've got it narrowed down. I think, it, I think if we're talking about a Samuel T. Picard antidote that actually I think it's in Whittier land but I haven't been able to pinpoint it yet because for some odd reason it's not searchable oh actually I have the book at home and of course I'd have to look through it but you're right uh, searchable we've become a generation that it's just easier uh, to look at a book electronically to find a certain information rather well, than... I, I, I've had to serve, you know, it's, it's a coping mechanism if you live in Florida and you're writing a book about the Merrimack Valley no, a lot easier. I mean, I got a lot of books about the Merrimack Valley down here. And then David but, also has America's Stonehenge, the Mystery Hill story. Uh, seems to me uh, where we are missing your latest title, which we'll have to add, which is, David? Why, the latest title is Our Guide to Massachusetts. Just give me a little advance notice on this stuff. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> Our Guide to Massachusetts, which was uh, co-written with my brother, the illustrious editor, author, Scott T. Goudsward. Oh, that reminds me, listeners, I received an email from Scott Goudswood uh, responding to uh, basically the on-air invitation uh, that he come on to talk about his work. Uh, his uh, email ended up in my spam folder. I did retrieve it. and so it's that a lot. Oh, well, anyway, so uh, d- don't take it personally, Scott. We'd love to have you on the program, and um, I will try to remember to respond to that email. But I hope you're listening. Uh, well, I think he's home. Does that count for something? All right. I guess apparently he's in this neighborhood quite a bit. So, all right. Anyway, here's a, here's a little more about David Goudswood. Raised on the summit of Scotland Hill, brings his New England sensibilities and respect for historical perspective Wait a minute. To his work. I think I left out a word here. Although living in Florida... I I just can't work with amateurs anymore. I'm sorry. Actually, didn't you write this? (laughs) Maybe. Although living in Florida, his bibliography consists primarily of New England topics. Doesn't sound like something I'd write. Maybe it got edited. Speaking of getting edited, I guess we've just been taken off the air on Channel 22. Uh, uh, the story of my life. <laughs> All right. Well, we worked this in anyway, folks. So, listen, <laughs> you've got Roxanne Dent's book, The Twelve Days of Christmas. We'll give away a copy, hopefully next week. We have David Goudswood's books. And if you go through these, this page under Membership and Members Shop, uh, you'll see some uh, other great local authors. So uh, that's a good place to leave it, I think, for the holidays. So, David, anything else in your mind? Because I don't know if we ever let you say what you wanted to say. No, I was, I, I'm intrigued by the stained glass, and I think it's, it's really going to come down to whether or not the UU Church has got any photographs of the crack itself. Yeah, be- the before? Yeah. Yeah, I, either that, before or during. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, I think, is going to be the challenge. But I've agreed to meet this family member at the church. And even inside, you're going to need, one will need binoculars or something to read everything on the glass. Uh, but the family, uh, at least initially, disputes that even the, the, the left and right windows uh, were um, Rocco's work. So we're going to go read the signatures and just confirm all of the facts and then take another look at this story, which I do think is, is interesting. Well, I'm fascinated by it. I mean, I, I think it's a fun piece, and you know, we need more fun pieces. Now, I, well, I guess the, the family doesn't think it's so fun, but, um, well, you know, uh, Barney Gallagher once told me that if um, people complain about a story, you're doing the right thing. So I if don't people know. People complain about it, that means at least they read it. All right, so uh, that word is getting around. Uh, thank you to fans who brought our WHAV Facebook to 700 likes today. I believe that's the number. Let's see if we're we're gone up any further than that. I'm on the wrong page. So there it is. Yeah, 700 likes today. Uh, that's grown like more than 250 or so uh, since the new new site went on. So I guess we're making progress. And, David, do you bank at TD Bank? Yes, I do, but not in the Hazel one. But, of course, it says 260,000 customer names from around, around the country. You know, it's, it's funny, though. Uh, I've got a brand-new car that hasn't been activated yet, so I'm covered either way. Apparently, there was a breach at Home Depot during a time period when I used the card. I had that so happen, too, with another TD bank. bank issued a new card. I just haven't gotten around to it activating it so all of a sudden now i kind of have motivation to do so yeah very interesting these things but there'll be more on whav news tomorrow david i guess we're at the end of the program thank you for calling in and, always good talking to you and here. we'll have some fun I'm, I'm actually glad that people are talking about the haverhill heritage series because it gives us more motivation to turn out some stories oh, oh. i got a couple of buttes down the road coming for you all right and of course um I finally got through uh, the FM chapter. Uh, I don't know what you thought of that. <laughs> tell you the truth, I'm not going to read it until I actually have to steal it for the history of WHAB book that we are co-writing. Yeah, that's my... Uh, that way it's fresh and I know what I'm looking at. Yeah, that was my motivation is that I'm going to knock out um, 
uh, the FM chapters. And uh, yeah. now we, of course, there's one left to be written anyway, at least one, and that is the uh, WHAV, which um, anyone who's still listening will call this the bonus show. Um, the um, there's a slight change in plans. Um, but not, it's all good news. So, uh, it looks like the frequency might not be 98.1 after all, but rather 97.9. That, and that makes a difference because of the conflict with the church? Exactly. Or, we are, ah. we are trading frequencies, uh, and moving east, and they are moving west, and that'll okay. keep enough distance between us so we both can go on the air. And thanks to engineers and the electronic equivalent of shoehorns, we might be able to make this work. You're moving the, the transmitter east? Yes, I know we haven't had a chance to discuss this yet, and uh, I'm not sure how much the attorneys want me talking about it. Well, uh, I'll hang up and call back. <laughs> How's that? All right, so anyway, folks, uh, there's those of you who stayed on for the bonus show, juicy tidbits for uh, the future. All right, David, well, thank you very much. We'll talk a little later. Talk to you later. Take care. All right. Uh, poor Nate, you know, it's uh, 834 by the studio clock, and um, he has orders to be home at 835. So we're going to we're going to get him out of here. Everyone have a great night. We'll be back with more of the open mic show next Monday, same time. Open mic. Join Tim Coco live on the open mic again next Monday night at 630. The opinions expressed on the open mic show are not necessarily those of WHAV, its underwriters or affiliated stations. The open mic show came to you from the Edwin V. Johnson newsroom. It's 835. This is Pacifica Radio for the Merrimack Valley, WHAV. Catch the wave! Melinda's Garden Moments help gardeners create and maintain a healthy, beautiful garden with ease, inside or out, and all year long. This is Melinda Myers, inviting you to tune in every weekday morning, right here on WHAV. You'll learn creative ways to grow your own vegetables and herbs, while beautiful